Welcome back to another episode of The Debrief from Canada. I'm Tyler Norton and from the USA, that's Mr. John Bergman uh, on the right side of the screen. And uh, we're back to talk about the Adidas Rockstars. This is the first comp that isn't a World Cup that we're talking about. Uh, and the reason we're doing it is because uh, one of you said so. Uh, so anyway, we're back. No, uh, it's fun because it's something that has an entirely different format, uh, an entirely different level of importance. And uh, it's a popular comp. It's been running for a long time. And as the athletes said, it's one of their favorite comps of the year. So why not talk about it? Um, I don't want to talk too much about the the boulders and performance and stuff because honestly, I'm pooped of just talking about boulders and climbing. But we'll quickly just go over how things turned out. Uh the biggest story is probably in second place, but we'll run through this podium. Your first place finishers were uh, Futaba Ito and Yoshiyuki Ogata from Japan. Second place was Yanya Garnbret and from Austria, Florian Klingler, kind of the dark horse of the competition. And third place was Zhang Wanchan and Ai Mori. Uh, is a really well-rounded field, considering the semifinals, especially for women, was incredibly hard. Like, uh, I think it was two-thirds of all the climbers in women's semifinals did not come away with the zone. Uh, you actually came out with a good set of finalists, and the finals themselves, I think, had the right climbers in it. And it reflected in the in the finalists. So you had Yanya, who was supposed to be there, and Zhang Wan, Yoshiyuki. I know the men's field is always a shit show. You never know who's going to make it. But uh, it made for a good field. And having that dark horse of Florian Klingler, who I'd certainly never paid any attention to, that made it a great story, especially because he made it to finals, but then he kept it up, right? He wasn't that one that gets to finals and falls flat. He made it all the way to the super final. Yeah, great performance by Florian. He was, if you look at all the other names, they were kind of names that we've seen on this the World Cup circuit this year, either either the bouldering circuit or the lead circuit, except for Florian. He was mm -hmm. just kind of, um, we, I, to my recollection, we haven't really talked about him uh, this season yet. So it was cool to see him. And, you know, it's, it's also interesting, too. I, I kind of think, I know we're going to talk about the format later, but I think of the Adidas Rockstar in the same vein as, like, the, the La Sportiva Legends only comp, which is that it's this, it's like a, it's a big comp for people that maybe don't necessarily watch comps, right? Sure. Like, during the season, uh, during the World Cup season. And so it was, in that respect, it was kind of nice to, um, to introduce uh, kind of a new audience or a new comp audience to some of the names that are the mainstays on the World Cup circuit this, this season. That's a very, I noticed that in chat a lot was people asking like, who is this climber or who is this climber? And it was finals. Like we, we know all of the climbers. Uh, so yeah. people wondering who is climbing right now, who's Aimori, who's uh, Luch Karakovic and stuff like that. It certainly had some climbers that are some, some uh, viewers that aren't regular uh, audience members, which was, uh, which was pretty cool. Um, in terms of the climbing, pretty like standard World Cup style boulders. It was interesting to hear that uh, Laurent Laporte, who was uh, apparently chiefing this comp as well, he never stops. Uh, he mentioned that this was a comp where they feel they get to take it as more of an experimental uh, event, that they take more risks. He used the word uh, like uh, like a laboratory, uh, mm -hmm. which was kind of cool. I didn't see anything too crazy aside from another like hand jam sequence uh, in uh, in men's number three, which, of course, he was the one that that put that together for Maringen at the start of the season as well. Um, not to say that the boulders were bad. It's just no no really big surprises, I don't think. Yeah, I think it's kind of funny that he said that because I sort of thought of these boulders as they were great. I didn't have any problem with them, but just pretty typical World Cup style fare. Um, and, and I think men's three, in my opinion, was kind of derivative, I guess, of the Meringen sure. boulder. I, it, like in my mind, I was thinking, uh, if you remember back to Meringen, the, like the day after that competition, the Monday after that, at at the gym I went to and I, I I'm curious if it's the same for you that like the world cup was like water cooler talk. People yeah, were actually talking totally. about it because of that boulder. And so I, I just got the sense that maybe this was an attempt to sort of duplicate some of that, that buzz, uh, as if, you know, we can talk about it. It, it didn't turn out that way because, uh, it <laughs> turns out setting two hand beta. jams is not as much of like a mind blower as everybody thought. Now that we've had one, yeah, and you can just dyno yeah. to the to the top and, and yeah, skip, exactly. you know, skip having to move traverse on those hand jams. So it, I, I yeah. think that that was kind of a, unfortunately, a kind of a swing and a miss for the route setting. They just, I, they just 
you know, didn't think about the people breaking it that way, I suppose. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of unfortunate. But The curious thing I had about his mention that they, uh, him mentioning that it was kind of a laboratory setting and then being experimental was that with the particular format, you have very little room for error in terms of getting climbers uh, separated because you only have those two boulders and finals to narrow the field down from six to three and then a single boulder to narrow them down from three to two. And so if, you, if you're taking those risks where you don't really know what's going on, uh, it makes it far more difficult to, to guarantee that separation. Um, at the start of 2018, I uh, was commentating for a comp that used approximately the same format. There were three boulder problems and after each boulder, you knocked two people out. And it was very difficult on the root setters and some of it worked and some of it didn't. But I feel like in a format like this where you have so little space to create that separation, you would wanna go with what you know and you do what you can to get that perfect separation because you know the universe isn't really on your side with a format like this. So it that was kind of curious for me. I mean, he doesn't have the the regulations and all the pressure of a World Cup circuit, you know. But uh, it uh, it it still felt that there was like extra pressure, but coming from a, a different dimension this time. So that was a unique comment from him. Yeah, and and you can you can. I suppose get a little more clever and and have these kind of flights of fancy with the setting here because you you do have a really stacked team of setters. Not that the IFSC World Cup circuit doesn't, but um, before this competition started, I was reading about it and the names of the people that were working on the setting. I think it wasn't like Melissa Lenev was, it was one a of huge them crew, or something. Yeah, and, yeah, and and and. Um, Manu Hassler, I think. Like, yeah, it was, I got the it list. Was it was, like, yeah, Laurent Laporte was leading it, and then he had his son, Matteo Laporte, by yep. his side. And apparently his daughter was setting for one of the Ticket to Rockstars events uh, previous <laughs> in the year. So apparently keep, they're keep just... Keep it in the family. Yeah, they're a root-setting factory. I wonder what his wife yeah. thinks about all this. Uh, Manu Hassler, Adam Pustelnik, uh, and uh, Thomas Alexi, who you know all those names from the World Cups, as well as Katie Lehman, uh, Tsukuru Hori, who I... We'll always think of as a competitor, but I guess he's root setting now. Felix Bookman uh, and Melissa Leneve. Yeah, it was yeah. like that was a huge crew. And uh, yeah. something I was curious about was um, with this venue for a stadium this size, I wouldn't be surprised if they had a shorter timeline to root set than they normally would for a World Cup, possibly. Um, stadium rates, I imagine, are more expensive per day. So maybe they said, okay, we're only going to have you know, one setting day or two setting days instead of three or whatever they would normally do for a World Cup. So maybe that's why the crew was so large. Uh, yeah, that's. but uh, it was a great crew. And I think uh, the boulders were probably better for having so many different perspectives in it. You know, what's interesting with that many setters, and I just now thought of this, but there's, I wonder if they ever run into any problem with like too many cooks in the kitchen, because at the end of the day, you know, setting is, if you talk to the, you know, people that this is their craft and this is their career, I mean, it's, they think of it like an art form. And, and as you know, uh, you know, in art or in music or whatever it is, like, <laughs> it's hard to get everybody to agree on 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 something when it comes to like a creative endeavor. So um, I just kind of wish I could have been a fly on the wall for those for those setting discussions. Um, I, I don't I, I don't think any of them would be trying to step on like Laurent Laporte. I feel like if he's in the crew and even Manu Hassler there as well, I feel like I would just listen to whatever the hell they said. Like I'm not gonna fuck around. Like those are the gatekeepers. Yeah. I feel like if you don't yeah. make them like you, you're never gonna set for a World Cup ever in your life. So yeah. hopefully that kept and, everything in order. And and rightly so. They're they're certainly legends, but you could I mean it's it's almost like if just imagine like a musical band and it's like you have 6 or 10 legends trying to get together and create sure. an album. It's like there's a lot of uh there, there's a lot of um a lot of genius there in this case with yeah. setting. So sometimes uh, that stuff works, sometimes you know, it doesn't. So, it does yeah. and it's it's too bad we didn't get as far as I know, I didn't notice any sort of um in my the YouTube stream, I didn't notice any like behind the scenes setting video or something. That would have been really fascinating to see. Yeah, there was there was just like you know montage stuff right. as they were introducing, and then in one of the uh, um, like studio shots where they just interviewed some of the setters, they spoke about. I think it was they recorded after semifinals, so they didn't talk so much about finals. It was more like how did semis go um, and uh, things like that. But uh, yeah, I I have to imagine it was it was pretty. Uh, 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 pretty good operation, but yeah, it's like a world star uh, setting crew. That was uh, a nice stuff, and and it proves that he, even you get the best setters in the world, and there's still going to be broken beta, as with men's three jumping yeah. dinoing to the top. Like that's you you can have all of those legendary setters together, 
and you still are going to have climbers doing doing just cool stuff to outthink them. Yeah, let's let's talk fun. about the super final because the I th- I thought it was a really interesting. Um, it it to me it is the highlight of the whole comp. It's what the entire comp boils down to, and honestly, it's it's my favorite part of the comp is the final climb. Uh, so for the women's super final, you had uh, Futaba Ito going head to head with Yanya Garnbret. And uh, it, it was kind of a, a really interesting one. And I hope Udo does a video review of it because it was this unique scenario where they both progressed through the problem and there was a space that got difficult or confusing. Uh, Yanya committed to sticking on this thing and like almost like in her head, she didn't want to give up the attempt sort mm-hmm. of because she kind of refused to let go, even though she couldn't figure out what was going on. Whereas Futaba just let go, started over again and reapproached it and then topped it before Yanya did. I don't know if Yanya even topped it. I don't think she actually got to the top. Um, so that was kind of a cool little dichotomy seeing those two approaches. And I, I in my head, I was yeah. kind of like, was Yanya aware that attempts don't really matter too much in this particular scenario? Like you could have just let go and start over again if you backed yourself into a corner. Yeah, there was so much of a, an exciting narrative there because as I was watching, you know, Futaba's on the wall, Yanya's on the wall, and then Futaba f- falls. Mm-hmm. And Yanya's still on the wall. And so I'm thinking like, oh, well, it's, it's, it's only a matter of time until Yanya, yeah, she, she's just going to keep going. And mm-hmm. then before you know it, it's like in the blink of an eye, Futaba has gotten back on the wall and gotten to the same place where, and Yanya hadn't moved on it yet. And so um, that was, just, yeah, it was really exciting. That was a, a sort of an edge of your seat moment. And for, um, for anybody who wants to watch these, by the way, the Adidas Rockstars YouTube channel has clipped just specifically the super finals for the men and the women. So if you want to watch this part, just queue it up. You can watch it right now. It's like it, they're literally less than a minute uh, to watch. I just don't want to get wrecked by Adidas on copyright shit. They're not like I'm happy to pick a fight with the IFSC, but not so much with Adidas. So I'm just going <laughs> to leave it for now. Uh, and then on the do, men's do you, uh, real fast, do you yeah. think um, and I and I'm not saying it necessarily does, but I'm just posing the question to you. Do you think it diminishes, it takes away anything from Yanya's season uh, to having not <laughs> won a DJ? Because she came so close, you know? And so it's like we, we, we'd we said before, she won the bouldering. She swept the bouldering season. She won, you know, three events or whatever at the World Championships. She qualified for the Olympics. It's like she keeps adding on to her 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 legendary 2019. She was so close to also winning Adidas Rockstars. Does that is that going to matter in uh, you know in history? <laughs> I think that I, I was like trying to fig- like I was trying to dig into like how historical this will be, and I yeah. feel like the answer is has to be no. Like on on the surface of it, because the format of this comp makes it not like it has even less integrity than a Boulder World Cup on its own. Mm-hmm. Uh, but also like if you go to, so for those of us keeping score and stuff, most, uh, Wikipedia entries, the IFSC stuff, it doesn't actually track Adidas Rockstars wins. So I think for most historians, if they look back in time, it's one of those things that will likely get skipped. And even if it doesn't get skipped, if they see it as a second place, hopefully they'll notice that it was kind of a, you know, she lost because it was like a, a speed boulder. And it's yeah. kind of not really how we do things. Yeah. Um, so no, it doesn't doesn't bother me at all. I, I would love to ask her if she was thinking about attempts and kind of forgot what was going on. Like if she was just that drilled into the headspace. Uh, but no, it doesn't take anything away. Yeah. It was a single boulder. So. Fuck it. No. Yeah, I don't think so either. But it's just interesting because... The story this season has just been... You should write that hot take, though. That would get so many fucking clicks. (laughs) You absolutely write that thing. Her her season is ruined because she didn't (laughs) win... She didn't win Adidas Rockstars. It would no, be, you could, just... that would that article would be more tilting than the live chat of the Adidas Rockstars. Like you could <laughs> troll the planet. No, seriously. Well, it's just I'm not funny even because... like give up give up your career as a, a journalist <laughs> with integrity. This is how to get the clicks. It's like I mean the ongoing thing, and Charlie has even expressed this. Charlie Bosco on commentary has said stuff like, "What else can she do this season? Like, what other accomplishment can she add on?" Sure. And and here was an, another thing she could have added on, and she did not. But I'm I'm with you. I don't think it. I mean, geez, how can you take anything away from her season? So yeah, yeah. But it's funny to think about. <laughs> I'll let the but people can people can comment below if they think this takes away anything from her her season. I think uh, anybody could, yeah, if anybody wants to take John Bergman's contract at Climbing Magazine, just write, right. uh, Yanya fumbles historic legacy with tragic rock stars loss. Well, it does feel like with, uh, especially with the bouldering season, it did feel like I was just sort of becoming like Yanya's personal reporter because every, every. You're so biased, every, John? Every, God. Every, 
well, the result of every competition, it was just like the Yanya show for the sure. bouldering season, you know. Um, finally, with uh, Che Un So in the lead season, we got some uh, some <laughs> something else to write about. Yeah, for real. Anyway. Uh, for the men's side, it was uh, kind of a different story. So Yoshiyuki Ogata uh, versus uh, Florian Klingler, who, again, was a dark horse, but managed to get himself into the final two. And for anybody that hasn't watched it yet, again, go to go to YouTube. I don't know. Search Adidas Rockstars on YouTube. Watch this. Although I'm not sure if they show the full thing because here's the deal with the with the super final. It's still four minutes, right? Is it four or five minutes for the super final? Oh, I think it was four. Uh, right? I think it's four. Let's say it's yeah. four. Yeah. So you've got two people head to head, same boulder, uh, and you have four minutes. And apparently, if nobody tops it in the four minutes, you just make shit up and you just go to the referee and figure out what happens. So neither of the guys <laughs> could top it in the four minutes. They got really close to sticking yeah. the hold on the ledge, but nobody uh, managed to top it. So then I think the the refs and the event organizers got together. Sorry. Uh, and they just added an extra crimp onto the wall and then kind of started all over again. So I think yeah. the super final you watch online, if you only watch the super final clip, just shows the edited version of the climb. It doesn't show the original one. Uh, but I thought that was really interesting and it didn't take anything away from it for me, which is the part that like, so when it was clear that they weren't going to top it, I was like, fuck this. Another reason this format is trash. But then when they tweaked it and they went again, I wasn't actually that bothered. And that's that's kind of the the predominant feeling I had from this comp was I wasn't bothered by a lot of things that I thought I would be bothered by. And it's making me like reconsider my entire perspective of bouldering. Um, but uh, <laughs> did that change anything for you? How did you feel about doing like well, a live tweak and then going back on it? Well, the live tweak was kind of weird. I think what they ended up doing, if I remember correctly, is just changing the little crimp, changing the direction of it so it was a little more positive. Is that what they did? Rather than adding a new crimp. Or did they add a, a, a completely new... Don't new... even remember. I'll have okay. to like, look it, at it. It's, yeah, anyway. Well, it doesn't matter because when Yoshiyuki ended up sending it, he, he, I think he just skipped the added whatever they tweaked anyway and just went straight up. And he got it... Um, just the way he was working on before the the tweak, before the change, right? Am I am I correct in remembering this? I just remember him topping it. At this point, okay. I was like two hours forty five minutes in, and I was like, oh, that's cool. Um, no, I should uh, <laughs> I should double check. We're now just I, I'm both speculating. Sure he, I, I'm looking at my notes now. So he so they didn't do it in the four minutes. They make this tweak, and then Yoshiyuki ends up just he. He goes up anyway and yeah, skips they, the little. They basically so, cruised it on the on the second because burn. He yeah. Was, yeah, they were trying. So they were trying to like pull on this little crimp, and and I think at the in the send, Yoshiyuki just ended up skip, skipping the crimp and, and going straight up anyway. Um, I'm I'm not a fan. I was not a fan of just all of a sudden nobody tops it. So let's just give them more time, make some changes. That felt a little weird to me, just because it felt like nobody really knew what to do <laughs> like it sure. felt like there was no there was no um overtime plan uh like like there are in in other sports where you 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 know what to do if it's a tie and the game ends you know you either award it to both competitors they split the gold so to speak or or there's a systematic way to go about it it feels like they didn't really know what to do so they're like well we can mess with this hold and give them more time um uh, so I, I how how yeah like how would you have preferred to do it because the the comment that they like that Sasha De Julian made on commentary was like hey this could just turn into like a day long red point session uh, if yeah. we just let them keep going if they did not here's what I would say if they did not ahead of time tell us what they're going to do if there's no top um, if they just say the competitors have four minutes to do this then at the end of those four minutes. I think you got to split the gold. Uh, I don't think, I don't, I don't have a problem with the the. It's like you said on the. I think it was the last the last debrief that we did. You said that you need to know the rules of the game before you go into it, right? Sure. So I would have wanted them to tell us before the super final started. Here's what we're gonna do if nobody climbs it in four minutes. Now, to my recollection. They did not mention that. They just said the competitors have four minutes to do it. And then after the four minutes were up, that's when they kind of said, well, here's what's going to happen now. Um, you can't you can't make up the rules after the fact. That it, yeah, I'm just I'm rereading through the uh, through the, the regulations one more time. And 
The organizer reserves the right to make any changes for the good of the athletes and the event. In case of undertaking changes, the organizers will announce them in advance. I don't know if that's that is referring to the competition procedure. And I think the thing here is that with this particular comp, because it's not a World Cup, I think I just don't care. I think I'm like, yeah, whatever. Like I wasn't watching like I, I didn't come into this comp with storylines. I wasn't like, let's see if Yanyev, for instance, can can sweep this thing. Let's see who the next big climber is. This is just like. I honestly watch this one for the format and for the execution of the event because I think it is uh, um, uh, one of those things we we should aim for in so many qualities. I want to see how they do it and what they do well with all the money they have and and what they can improve on and what we can learn from. So I I honestly wasn't watching it so much for the competition. um, And... And so I think it let myself have more fun with it. Uh, mm-hmm. I think you're totally right about having a policy in place but when you're determining a winner because there was a difference of, what, like 3,000 U.S. dollars between the winner mm-hmm. and the and second place. So yeah. I'd, I'd kind of want to know how to how to earn that money. But uh, at the same time, I mean, it's obviously like a different kind of comp. They were, you know, they were playing, you know, the Shrek soundtrack through half of the finals as yeah. tilting as that could have been for some people. Well, it's interesting that you say... Your mindset going into it because and and it's interesting knowing that the competitors seem to really love this competition because Mm -hmm. in my opinion uh, I think the first one of these was like 2011 if I remember and it was a while ago. Yeah Yeah, it's it's just not a competition that I Historically get psyched for and no, I don't either Well, and I was trying to figure out why that was like as soon as I knew that we were gonna do a debrief for this um, I wanted to I, I wanted to pinpoint like why am I not excited about this? Because as we've said, like the route setting's awesome. It's got the top competitors in the world. It like it has all the the, the makings for you think that you and I would both be like super stoked about it. Yeah. Um I I think at the end of the day, the reason I don't get as excited for it is because there is no larger context, right? Like sure. there's no season implication to this. Um, there's no narrative that you can draw from from previous season competitions. Um, it, it, and I know, I guess there is a circuit in the sense that there's like the rock stars all the over ticket the ticket to rock world. stars thing. Yeah. Yeah. But it's not quite the same as like no. a national competition that has its regional circuit or a, or the IFSC or something like that, the World Cup. So I think that's why I just don't I, I, I wasn't as jazzed by this. I'm, I'm not typically as excited about it is just because it's kind of this one-off weird event, funky format, and then it's done. And, and to your point about like the Wikipedia pages, it doesn't seem like it's really, uh, given historical weight for better or worse. Maybe it should. It's just like, you look at the format of the comp, it doesn't have integrity in determining a winner, right? Like it's not, if you were trying to like the best competitions for me are the ones that, that, make you feel like the winner was the best climber there, right? Yes. Uh, and this comp doesn't do that. It's it's It leaves too much to chance. It leaves too much to the flukes of the root setting. So it's not something I look at to help like adjust my barometer of who's good and who's not, right? I would never use this kind of comp for like world rankings. Um, and it is just ruined by the, well, I don't want to say ruined, but just the nature of the final means it's, it's, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's a little bit fluky and that's okay, but I, I would never use it to, uh, to actually kind of, uh, like change my opinions, but that's also kind of what I was excited to see this time around, because now that we've spent this entire season watching and talking about it, it is a good opportunity to look at alternatives. And that's a big thing I spend a ton of time thinking about is, uh, what would make me enjoy Boulder World Cups more? What would make the circuit more sustainable? What, um, what makes it, you know, a better viewing experience, but also respects the athletes. And for me, what, uh, with format specifically talking about making a better viewing experience, how do you get the best climbers, um, into finals every time? Because I personally believe that that is the event, not the qualifiers and the semifinals. Um, so let's, let's talk about the format and let's talk about stuff we liked and didn't like. First thing I like is, uh, even though it's, even though everything I just said about how this, the super final style kind of ruins the, I got to stop using the word ruins. It makes it more down to chance. The thing I like about the super final is it's a really easy format to watch and it makes me kind of wish there were more boulders. I would kind of wish we could have seen Yoshiyuki and um, Florian go head to head in more than one boulder. And if you start spreading out that, that style of climbing that, you know, speed bouldering, although that sounds like a curse to name it that, if there were more of those climbs and you can kind of even out the the results of it and get more of an average, give Florian the chance to come back on the second boulder, things like that, uh, that would 
maybe actually be a really intriguing bouldering format whether you want to have yeah. discussions about whether there's integrity or not but i really enjoyed watching the super final that was by far the best part of the comp i spent the rest of the comp taking notes and writing down stuff about production and the cameras and the crowd and all that kind of stuff and the only moment of the comp that held my attention for the climbing was the super final mm-hmm. um i didn't like that the men and women were climbing at the same time especially because we didn't get a chance to preview the boulders through the bouldering preview. We were watching like other stuff. We didn't actually get to talk about the problems. Um, But uh, yeah, I don't know in terms of the format. How do you feel about it? Uh, You know, it's I'm split two ways and the, I agree with what you said. The super final by itself is really exciting. Um, speed bouldering is not i mean that's what we're gonna call it for last we need a different word for that because it is it is i feel like that's the worst thing to name it because it'll just get so much disrespect well there is a history with speed bouldering though i mean they're they're even dating back to like the gopro the veil mountain games in like the first iterations of those had speed bouldering Mm -hmm. um you know whatever 10 15 years ago so it's not something we see on the world cup circuit but but it has been done before in in various formats. Um, I so I I that's fine. I don't have a problem with the super final. The the thing that bothers me is how the speed bouldering just comes out of nowhere. It's like it's here's here's the best analogy I can think of. Okay, again, let's think of other sports. Imagine running. Imagine you have uh, a tournament of people running the sixteen hundred meters, running the mile, whatever. And it's like it's whittled down, it's whittled down, and finally you get the last two competitors. And then you're like, okay, for the finals, we're going to have you guys run a 100-meter sprint. It's like sure, yeah. What? It's like speed sp- that never played a part in the rest of the tournament. Yeah, and totally. so to to all of a sudden do it at the very end, the, like it's, it just seems inco- incongruous. It, it's like where? why not do the speed – why not bring that speed aspect into the, into the other – previous rounds i guess um and and because then if they would do that then we would actually have some justification in saying okay you know futaba ito is she is the best at this format Mm -hmm. at this given year because she beat this person in round one then this person in the semifinals, and then this person in the finals of this at this speed bouldering format as it is now it's just it's just kind of it seems I can't think of any other better word than it's just weird to have uh, these rounds of kind of standard straight up uh, IFSC style bouldering. And then in the finals, it's like you're adding the speed element. Um, That's totally fair. Yeah. I, it's just I, kind of strange. Just the, the function of it, though, is how, you know, if you were to run everything as duels, because I think that's probably as as far as you can go in terms of practicality, like to have enough wall of the same angle that you run four, five, six eight people at a time on one boulder is just like you don't have the wall for it so if you only have you know space to run two people at a time you can't do these kind of start lists anymore like you have to have a different format for for finals or even semifinals if you want to take that format that deep um but that's the kind of stuff i love playing with like that how intriguing of an idea would that be and this is the kind of comp where you want to do it where it's probably not like it's not dependent on registration fees right the mm-hmm. IFSC, along with other reasons for it, they have the interest of you want as many athletes going because that helps bring that revenue in to make the events run. Whereas with the Adidas Rockstars, it's invite only, so you can do what you want. And honestly, as a business case for them, if you didn't have to run a qualifiers and a semifinals, if you could set on only one day, run the event on only one day, that could actually be a really compelling business case for them. Mm-hmm. If you whittle the field down to, let's say, invite the top 12 men, top 12 women, and you have four invites come or uh, four qualifiers come in from the ticket to rock stars, make it a single day event. That could be really intriguing. And mm-hmm. then the logistics just come down to what wall are you using? How active do the root setters have to be? Because this could be the kind of situation where everybody like climbs this boulder and then you have to take it down and then like put up another one right away and yeah. take it down and put up another one. This is the kind of crew that absolutely could have done that. And they also seem to have like 30 second to a minute breaks in between each round. Right. Not sure if they save that for commercial breaks or something, but they already have this kind of sense of, hey, we're going to leave time in our broadcast for uh, as a buffer. 
Um, and hey, like we, we've kind of talked in the past about like world's fastest ground crew in terms of route setting and stuff. How mm-hmm. sick would that be if you just yeah. have Laurent Laporte and his band of merry men coming out and just stripping and resetting a wall in like 30 seconds? That would be sick. That would be um, sick. Yeah. And, and you know, I as we were discussing this, I just thought of I, I wonder you had mentioned that it's it's invite only, um, at least for like the elite level. Yeah. I wonder did I wonder if invites got extended to Yiling Song and Reza mm-hmm. and and uh, who else? Mikhail Mawem, like all these speed climbing specialists, because it, like Mikhail especially, I don't know if he was there. He might have been in the earlier rounds, but I I wonder how a speed climber would have done on that on that uh, the super final. It, you know, I mean, I know yeah. it's not speed climbing in the traditional like speed climbing sense where they do this route that they know backwards and forwards. But nonetheless, there's a speed climbing component. So to not invite speed climbers um, to at least give them a shot to make it to the super. How, how like can you name any speed climbers that you think would actually stand a really good chance of making it to like because you have to become top two. Right. And to get to top two, you have to beat all yeah. these world class boulders. I don't know yeah. if that would be possible for most of them. Maybe Mikhail. I think he's the only one that I would um, like think of. Maybe, uh, yeah. Depending on de- like depending on the field, and if we're calling them speed climbers, um, yeah. Who was I going to say? Well, I guess like Miho is the closest one that I would say in terms of like setting good times. Sean McCall, but Sean again, McCall, they're not like, they're not like the speed elite. They're just good. Yeah, at speed. that's an interesting question though. I, I'd have to look at the list. I mean, I can think of like Americans like John Brazer would be interesting because I know he's. He's a speed specialist, but he's he you know he's good at bouldering, good at ropes too. So I that's that's an interesting point. I don't know if I could imagine any of them making it to the super final, uh, where you essentially would have to beat. I mean, look, you'd have to beat Yanya and Futaba Ito in bouldering. Yeah. It's like good yeah, luck, yeah. Yeah, right? Um, yeah. Good luck if you're like here. If you're here are all of the like here are the people from the World Championship finals of bouldering, and now you have to right. beat them. Yeah. Yeah. But it's just uh, I don't know. The the point. Your point is well taken, though. I like it that. As much as I can, um, I don't know, complain, I guess, that it's not, that there is no greater context for this. I do like that there are just people out there, organiz- organizers out there, companies like Adidas, playing with the format yes. and trying to think of cool things. Now, I hope at some point, I do hope that it, it levels out and, and, and we get kind of a consistent comp format period across the board i maybe we're not there yet because maybe the ifsc format isn't you know most people wouldn't consider that ideal yet and maybe adidas rock stars most people wouldn't consider that ideal but i do hope at some point whether it's 10 years whether it's 50 years i hope at some point there becomes like a standard format that's acceptable Mm -hmm. as we've said before just for the sake of history so you can look at so it's like you know you look at like football and stuff and it's it's not like the rules are drastically different from, from no. it's like th- th- but again this it, is- and this is why this is important because you only get to that state of having a consistent rule book if everybody thinks the rule book is really good or the format is really good and in a lot of sports cases it takes centuries to yep. to get to that point so that's why like you said having companies spending money to run big comps with a lot of eyeballs for people to get to experience some kind of different thing is super important uh, yeah. Just like La Sportiva Legends only, like these are really valuable comps. And I think the one thing that that uh, and you know it works for them. They're getting viewers or whatever. I hope they keep tweaking and working through this stuff and not doing the same format. I think the best change that Adidas Rockstars has done so far is get rid of the bands. Mm-hmm. That's like my lasting memory from the early ones of just having live bands trying to play uh, yeah. to a competition hate it not my style um i know people were complaining about this dj because he would like go in and out of of like edm stuff and then into rock and like getting into like the proclaimers and shit and then you had some you know there was some weird stuff i thought it was hilarious because again i don't really give a shit about the results of this comp so you know do your thing um but uh i hope they play around with the with the format more and more um the invite structure is something i really like about it that's like limiting the field is helpful because I like the idea of only having the best there. And the ticket to Rockstars thing is really intriguing because that's I think that's the kind of method I would like to see for these comps. I would love an international circuit of competitions where the best are always invited. We don't have flukes mm-hmm. where maybe somebody doesn't, you know, 
I don't really want the country to be in charge. I would like the event organizer to be in charge of who they bring. It lets them decide, yeah. hey, do we want strong people? Do we want people with a really big following? Do we want those charismatic people? You get to decide who most of your competitors are. And then a really robust qualifying format can bring in those unexpected talents, uh, which right now, in my opinion, we have too many of, right? Like if you go to a World Cup, they're, like the bottom half of the list is people that are not going to make a finals probably ever. Uh, and they take time and they take resources and great. You got a zone like cool, good for yourself. But from the viewer perspective, which I will always say is the most important part of, of sporting events, uh, mm -hmm. it doesn't add anything and it just makes it more difficult. So this was really cool. Yeah. Um, having those basically wild cards from around the world flown in perfect. Like you don't have to get yourself there. Adidas takes care of you. That's, yeah. that's a great model. I love that. I do too. I, I love as I have as much as I can bicker about certain aspects of this competition. I do. I think they do a lot of things right. And I really love the invitation um, aspect to it. I, as, as an American, I'm wondering why more Americans were not there. If they turned down the invitations, um, maybe because, Brooke Rabatou was the only one who qualified for Toulouse, so maybe other, maybe the most of the Americans are just like you know, or, you know, or qualified Tokyo. for the Olympics. Yeah, Tokyo. Yeah. So maybe most of the Americans are, are focusing on the Toulouse qualifying event. I don't mm -hmm. know. Um, Sierra Blair Coyle, I think, was the only um, uh, like uh, competitor there who who you know we sometimes see on the IFSC circuit as well, uh, or we have in the in in the past. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know what the deal is there with with more Americans. Either they weren't invited or they didn't accept invitations. Um, mm. But uh, but yeah, I'm with you. I like the I, I like I like that aspect of it. Give them the invitations, fly them in, um, treat them like rock stars, for lack of a better word. Yeah, I guess the, what I'm curious about is did did those people who you know you win the local or the continental things and then you get to the ticket to rock stars final. If you don't win anything there, you probably don't stand much of a chance of actually making it to the finals, right? So may, it could, it probably is a net loss for those mm -hmm. competitors anyway. So maybe you just turn it down and say no. Um, but I, I was laughing so hard at the, uh, they did an interview with like the male uh, wildcard guys. I think it was a, an American named Simon Beckert or Simon. Yeah. Just that's like climbers are so shit on microphones, but I love it when you have somebody like that who is the like, perfect american dirtbag climber just yeah. i thought that was super funny if anybody gets a chance to watch that that was uh it was hilarious. good yeah, yeah. And, and when i say there were no americans i, I want to be clear or, or not many americans what mm. i'm what i'm meaning is like americans that we've also seen on this season's world cup circuit yeah. right there was no ashima there was no sean bailey no margo hayes no brooke rabbit um but there were americans it, that had qualified through the uh kind of the global uh rock stars events yeah yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So I, th I thought that was really cool. I know a yeah. bunch of these climbers are going to Block Shop Open this weekend. Kind of, kind of a neat point of the season where they've got these comps with decent money, where they're getting like invited and flown out to, and probably earn a paycheck if the field isn't too deep. It's kind of a, an interesting time of year for a lot of these guys. Do you? Let me ask you. Do you? Which do you like better? Let's just pose it that way: the IFSC format for a bouldering final, or do you like the the structure where it's like six are whittled down to three or whittled down to two you know which like do you like that that sort of chip away aspect of the finalists uh okay yeah so i like the super final itself i yeah. hate the whittling it down with so few boulders um yeah because i will always like second guess the results i'll always so yeah straight up so i still need to finish writing the script for an essay i'd like to put out which is um the idea that root setting by itself adds a lot of um, randomness into climbing because you can never know what to train for as a climber. We all talk about like climbing training for comps as be as well-rounded as possible and be in the best possible shape. And then you stand the best chance of doing well on the climbs you're presented with because you never know what you're going to get. Sometimes the boulders are good for you. Sometimes they're bad for you. Sometimes they're good for everybody. Sometimes they're bad for everybody. And so unlike a lot of sports where the, the playing field is even all the time, you always know what to expect. That's just not the case in climbing. So I will always have more respect for the results that come from a comp where there are lots of boulders and you get to see everybody on a wide variety of climbs because then you get more of an average and you get to actually see who over a bunch of different uh, uh, climbs is the better climber. Um, it's 
I don't golf probably isn't the best example, but let's say, you know, the, uh, what, what's the, like the master's tournament is over 18 holes times four, mm-hmm. right? I can't do the math on the top of my head, but that is a four straight days of golfing. You play the course four separate times before you win that event. And the virtue of that is that it doesn't come down to fluke. It doesn't come down to, yo, I was on the tee and I teed off and there was a huge gust of wind and I'm fucked because golf is like no rules and it's just whatever God does to you, you just have to live with it. That's kind of the the angle I take from it. So any competition where it's down to two boulders to knock people out, I think that's not something uh, that I would use to determine who's good and who's bad. I don't mind it for an event like this because whatever, like it's a silly comp that's just for fun and it's experimenting with stuff. But I I don't see it as something that uh, puts out consistent results that I would believe in. And the best comps for me are the ones where I get to follow the horse race, like I've said many times. I like to see who's actually winning and who's not. And I want upsets to be earned, right? I don't Mm -hmm. want it to be, hey, you climbed exactly two boulders and they were both good for you and that's like that's to me is is not a very strong upset so so i like the super final i do not like the knockout based on this many boulders if you took six finalists and made them all climb four boulders and then cut it down to four or three like then i would be more trusting of that i'd be like okay that's Mm -hmm. a bigger set of information i don't mind so much um but it's just too few boulders to uh to really think it tells you anything i agree i I, and you you're you're struggling with the time here also because like you said there's a venue how how you know how long do you want these rounds to last i love just in general bracket tournaments in any sport i think it's a great way to just um to just narrow down the field and i think that there's kind of some inherent uh excitement in that in just kind of that pyramid structure of it but um but yeah there's there's just too much left to chance when it's just two boulders um and, and you know uh and and there's too much that can be left out of that right like i don't think we saw any for example like slabs right and um you're just so you're just limited when you can only do two boulders or f- even four boulders you're so limited in in how the degree to which you can test the competitors let alone whittle them down with any certainty to to uh you know to the best so yeah Yep. Uh, big thing that came up uh, that I that people were talking about, especially like in Rootsetters forums, was the fact that this was a dual text wall, which I would not have noticed had I not heard about it on the internet and had I not heard the uh, commentators talk about it. So apparently the top band, like kind of the at the very top of the wall before you top out, it had no texture on it. Saw a lot of people grabbing the edge regardless and topping out just using the wall. Um, not sure how much that changed. Just talking about walls for for one, like back in the like, let's say, sorry, I'm really burpy today. What's going on? Um, going back a few years, I remember people talking about wall texture and stuff. I think it was around the time that Walltopia was already really big, and Rockworks was coming out with their new like glossy kind of uh, modern texture and uh, vertical solutions does a fairly high gloss wall. And mm-hmm. people spend a lot of time talking about this and it doesn't really come up anymore. Is it, do you think it's maybe just because holds are so freaking big that like smearing on the wall isn't really a factor anymore, especially with so much dynamic movement? Like smearing has kind of become less of a, uh, it plays like a smaller role in bouldering specifically. I think that's probably true too. Uh, and I just think the competitors are just, they're so strong that a lot of times these days, I mean, you look at the training that they do and they're doing just like, you know, mono pull, one arm pull ups. It's like the old one arm no, mono mantle. Yeah. It's like yeah. instead of smearing, like a lot of times they, they'll just campus it. And it's like it's so I think, yeah, you're exactly right. It's just kind of the evolution of the sport has made that um, you just don't see it that much. But but dual texture walls are you're starting to see them there. I, I know there was like. Uh, a company at CWA this past year that was featuring them for gyms. Mm-hmm. Um, I think there, the thinking there was more so that um, the gym could maybe use them, use the dual text design to like to create like the gym's logo in the sure. wall, for example, like have the logo be a different texture. Right. But certainly you could, I mean, the possibilities are endless in terms of what you could design uh, for a facility. So I, I do think that that's something, I mean, it's kind of like the next evolution, right? We saw dual text hold, holds, then like dual text volumes. And now I'm sure that 
more and more people were going to start seeing whether or not it'll catch on. Yeah, sure I don't. I feel like it's. Will. I feel like it's just one of those things that it's not gonna like it. First of all, I don't think it matters too much. But to me, it's kind of the idea of if you sell like let's say you sell painters canvases, right? And it's kind of their job to create on it. It's like if I started selling a line of canvases that had a giant like red square in the center or like I cut a piece out of it. And I'm like, it gives you so many opportunities for like new, new things. It's You're going to set like thousands of climbs on this thing before you take yeah. it down. How, how much of an effect is this really going to have? And you have no control over where it is. I, I don't really know. It's not something I'm sold on. I also don't spend much time smearing anymore it's not really uh a thing that that comes up in my climbing uh in the in the places that i climb i don't know i'm i'm not sure if, but uh yeah it didn't seem to have too much of an effect on the competition i it's not even new technology it's just like yeah we, all of these things existed we just like we put them together this time so yeah i don't know if i would have noticed it to be honest if not i would not have been pointed out by yeah. i think like you said i think it was sasha who mentioned it on commentary i don't think i would have noticed it um but uh, but I like that p even if it doesn't catch on, I'm I'm all for people, you know, doing kind of innovative stuff or thinking outside the box. And I know in the commentary, one of the things people were saying in the chat, in the live chat for the stream, people were saying that they should have a wall that's clear, like a plexiglass, for lack yeah. of a better word, which I know I haven't really seen that that much in, a, in, in U.S. gyms. I know in South Korea, when I lived there, there was a gym that had that. Um, it just it was it's cool in concept but what ends up happening is it just gets crazy smeared with yeah. with rubber and it just it it after a little bit of use it does not look it's it's not clear yeah. needless to say yeah. um but it would like i could see like i could see some organiz, organizer or maybe like the olympics down the road or something wanting to do something like that for clever camera stuff right because yeah if you think, totally if you could if you could get the uh, essentially like the 180 degree view of the climber climbing the wall that could be kind of interesting i think plexiglass type of a wall it would work better as a one-off just for a competition and then you take the wall down as opposed to a gym where like you put it up and it stays up and it gets dirty and stuff yeah. the, that's kind of uh because i there was a thing i saw i did see that guy in, in the comments uh and something i've always wanted to try and i'm not sure if this is an original idea of mine or if i saw it somewhere and then i've just let myself think that i created it but with the clear thing i've, I've yeah. always loved if you had like a, a two-sided wall so whether it's for like a clip and climb like funtopia style thing or for like an odd competition how fun would it be that you're standing at the bottom of a lead wall and you're looking through the wall and your your competitor is right in front of you and you just like climb a mirrored climb and you're like looking at each other the whole time Jeez. i think that would be so fun like that just yeah, what you know about a speed climbing like that yeah like, that, like, like that kind of thing head. that would be yeah, that such would a blast be, that would be kind of cool i mean so. I, I, yeah and i i think Another thing that you're starting to see now is our gyms that have lighted holds. Um, I think it's only a matter of time until we see some gym that's like completely light lit lit holds, I guess, or whatever mm -hmm. you'd call it. Um, and and you know it's like dark inside, but you're climbing on on. That'd be kind of cool. There's yeah. there is definitely room for for um, clever thinking when it comes to this type of stuff. When and, did this become a a brainstorming session for sick climbing gym birthday parties? I don't know, Donna. but I'll tell you, if there's ever a chance where you and I can <laughs> climb. Looking eye to eye, uh, yeah. count in. That'd be fun. Yeah, <laughs> that would be. Have, we'll, we'll do a debrief while we're climbing. That would be sick. That would be uh, that would be super sick. Yeah, um, I don't remember where we were in talking about the competition itself, but let's move. Uh, oh, other format, format, or not just format, but things we we liked or didn't like about. Yeah. It. So the the big one right off the bat was the crowd. I fucking loved the crowd. I loved the venue. We talked about how nice would it be if comps could be in like indoors all the time. We were, I think we were mostly talking about weather, right? I think that's probably what we were talking about when we were mentioning that, but like an indoor crowd, you've got those steep bleachers. And so you felt the impact of this crowd, which was probably smaller than the crowd at Munich or the crowd at Vale. Like almost certainly I'm estimating based off of like the, uh, um, the capacity of the Porsche arena and the fact that they were only using half of it. I think the audience would have been like two to 3000 people. Um, again, not a paid audience. It was all free. So take from that what you will. Uh, but the crowd was awesome. Um, yeah. I loved it, the environment of it. I did too. And I don't know what all plays into that. I, maybe the, the kind of music aspect makes it feel a little more festive. Um, 
I, well, I, having it blacked out, like having a dark area, having that many people, and it wasn't like they were standing further and further back, right? Those bleachers meant everybody had a fairly intimate experience. Mm-hmm. And then you get the light show on top of that. So it's not just lights on the walls, but the entire atmosphere of the of the, the venue is is uh is lit up in in those fun ways i th- i just thought it was amazing and that's the kind of audience i'd love for every world cup if you could afford venues like that i thought that that's that's kind of what we should what we should aim for long term it, and it looked yeah. in my opinion so much more respectable as an event like if i watch a sporting event and i see something like we see at most world cups where it's a wall under a tent in a field I'm like, yeah. okay, I got an idea of what this is. But when I see that, when I see the lights and I see the confetti cannons and shit, and I see that audience right there standing up and screaming, uh, that has a way bigger effect on me. It looks so much more professional. Um, and again, the budget is obviously different between uh, this one Adidas Rockstars and World Cups, but it's certainly something to aim for, in my opinion. Yeah, and let's not underestimate the the benefit of having the Adidas brand the name attached to it. That's a big deal. I mean, like people that see that casual climbers that see that, um, I, I, there's probably plenty of climbers out there that, that love climbing, but they don't know what the IFSC is. They've Mm -hmm. never heard of that. They have no idea, but if they see Adidas, they sure as heck know what that is. And, and that can draw people in that can, that can create intrigue. Um, that's a big deal. And, and so I think maybe that added to it as well. Uh, just kind of hyping the crowd. It's it. Yeah. I wish it's like, if we could take the IFSC world cup events and, and have this crowd every time, that'd Mm -hmm. be awesome because they were, they were great. Yeah. 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 It was, it was, I think probably one of the best parts of it. Um, now in terms of, uh, like one thing that came up and this is, we're getting kind of into the weeds of production stuff was, and I'm basically at this point just going like chronological through my notes. Yeah. Um, Liam Lonsdale, Sasha to Julian doing a good job. Uh, mm-hmm. They had an English announcer though. And I kind of wish through the athlete intros for one that we just let the stage host take the audio. That's something that really bothered me. I want there to be a better connection between all of those people, the stage host, the interviewers, the commentators, hopefully in the future, the analysts have a better sharing of that because it felt like there was a lot going on. And I kind of felt like there was a constant chaos in the broadcast of there was always an MC and then you had Sasha and, uh, and Liam going off. And that was tough for me. And it felt like that was one of the most unpolished parts of the broadcast was that there wasn't somebody calling the shots and saying, okay, this is the person that we're taking audio from. Now, this is where we're taking audio. I wish that was dealt with a little better because that would have changed the experience a lot for me. Yeah, that's a pet peeve I have, not just for this competition, but just in general. Like when you you see, the, like it happens sometimes where you have the people talking, but you can also hear the MC mm-hmm. in the venue like over them and their yeah. mic's picking it up. It just, like you said, it seems like everybody's just not really in sync in, in, in whose role it is. I mean, you all, you almost have to decide. I think you you have to make a decision. Do you want this to, to be primarily focused on the broadcast or do you want it to be primarily focused on the the in venue experience yeah and and it's hard to have both that's not to say it can't be done but if you're gonna have if it's like you want to have a dj there and you want to have a an mc and you want to have those people hyping the crowd that's there and you also want to have production values for the live stream and you want to have commentators that that people are hearing who are watching it uh, all over the world or whatever you can have both but if you want to have both it, you need to it you really need to work hard on on making that that operation pretty tight because because it's real noticeable when it's out of sync or or when there's like overlap or just everybody's not on the same page um yeah and 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 it's too bad because it seems like um it seems like all those kind of separate elements were really good in their own right mm-hmm. but just when combined it's like I don't know if this is quite working. Yeah, and I think what what surprised me the most is that there there was clearly a, a, you know this event clearly had a director and probably a bigger than normal production staff in the truck or in the production room because they were running you know VTRs they had all of that B roll going on the commentators they had scripts so they were clearly being told hey we're going to run this video talk about this or we're talking about this sponsor or throw to this like clip about uh, the root setting there was clearly coordination going on and a lot of it was amazing but the one audio thing and and knowing like who is the dominant uh, speaker at any time was pretty frustrating um yeah. 
yeah, talking about like multi, uh, like multilingual events is really mm-hmm. hard. Um, I'm a huge proponent of uh, having different streams for different languages. I think that's a really big deal. Oh, and, yeah. and frankly, in climbing, I would rather keep the MCs always in English, especially, well, obvious bias, but uh, like in Europe where English is the lingua franca, I guess, if we're still using that phrase, uh, you can get away with it, um, and it just suits the largest audience when you're watching online. But yeah, have a Chinese stream and have mm-hmm. a French stream or whatever other languages have have big viewership, rather than just making it all be through uh, through English. Um, what was the other thing? I, I this is such a like a tiny little gripe, but the I, I'm over light shows. Like if we could just cancel all the light shows that start these competitions. Uh, And this one wasn't even a very good one. It was like they just had like lights going around and then they blew off some confetti. And that was supposed to be the build up for the event. Um, I kind of wish they had a pre-production team that sat down with the athletes and just did a one minute video intro where it was just like little cuts of interviewing the athletes talking about what this meant to them or the excitement or like, you know, build up some of the story and saying, you know, I'm here to win all this kind of crap. That would have been so much more intriguing as a way to blow off the show rather than just having some lights windmilling around and then firing some paper into the air. Um, I felt like that was a lost, uh, lost moment. Yeah. I've never been a fan of the light shows um, even into the IFSC stuff. I, I get the same opinion with the same impression with this, where it was probably kind of neat if you were there in the audience. Um, but that just goes to my point. That's like, who, like, who do you, which are, which audience is larger? Those that are there or the people watching online and whichever, or, or on TV or whatever the, you know, the case is yeah. for the, the respective comp and whichever audience is greater. Like that's the audience that you should be catering to, mm-hmm. I think. Um, and, and these light shows, unless you're going to have, just incredible pyro and like <laughs> burn stuff. the place down. Yeah. It just, <laughs> it, it just comes across as pretty, um, just pretty, I don't know, just pretty tiny on when you're watching yeah. it on like a little YouTube screen. Um, just not real impressive. Uh, I'm not a fan of it. I want to get to the climbing or at least I want to hear from the climbers and kind of get mm-hmm. into that story. I, all the pomp and circumstance with uh, confetti and, and lights and stuff. I'm not, it's not my cup of tea. Yeah, I, I think saving the like the confetti at the end was awesome. Like that's yeah. I like I feel like lights and pyro and all that stuff should always be used to amplify moments. But there was a minute at the start of the broadcast, the pump up moment where it wasn't amplifying anything. It was just there by itself. And that felt like a, a lose. Uh, yeah. in my opinion. Um, they did a lot of cool video stuff, though, like the the video montages of at least the root setters kind of introducing them. Uh, that was super useful. Um, and so there's clearly the potential there, and I hope they use that for some other stuff, um, some more actual storytelling. It would give the commentators a break because I would prefer it if the commentators really only had to engage when the climbing started, and I would prefer the time up to that be run by the stage host or have it be run by a team of analysts. But if you start that event with a video at the top being like Yanya, like just talking shit, just absolutely like wrecking, I don't know, a Keo or whoever, just, you know, just build up some story. The yeah. stage host takes over. He welcomes everybody to the stadium. You introduce the athletes and then they go into preview mode. And then you've got two analysts and it can be Udo Newman and whoever the fuck else or get, uh, get Nikki and get those two guys to just talk about the boulders. And then preview is done and we're throwing it to Sasha and Liam and they get to take it out through the rest of the climbing rather than, you know, Sasha, Sasha and Liam having to cope with all of that stuff, which is a lot to deal with, especially when you're trying to run all of those sponsor hits and keep track of starting orders, which I know Liam was having trouble with, although it was kind of weird that they were bringing out the athletes in that order. So I wish there was, you know, they had a lot of resources. They had a stage guy. They had a lot of talented people there for the event because they use them for those uh, in-studio conversation pieces. Uh, they had all the people there and I, I kind of hope that next year they can delineate the process of how those are used for the uh, broadcast. Cause for me, as somebody that wants to do more broadcasting, that's something I'm really looking forward to. And I think it would up the quality because asking commentators to do analysis, asking them to share space with a stage host when you don't have mm-hmm. anybody telling you what the stage host is going to say, it's so hard. And so yeah. I, I hope that gets used next year. Well, and, and what's interesting is these elements that we would like to see in this production, it's like these are elements that a lot of times you see at smaller, much smaller competitions. Like if you have a local, just your average local gym, and they have a big competition and they want to live stream it, mm-hmm. 
they're not they, they don't have a light show they don't have confetti anything no. like that so a lot of times leading into it just to fill time they'll bring in like the the two people if there's people doing commentary they'll be like hey we're gonna bring in like the route setter and he's yep. gonna give us our opinion and then it's like hey let's bring in the gym manager and it's like okay you know some of these guys like <laughs> let's bring in our, it, right? our youth programming coordinator yeah, to uh and, talk, yeah but that's essentially that's what we're asking Right. It's just like it, we're asking, like, bring in some of these people that can help tell the story for the lead in. Mm -hmm. You don't have to like it doesn't have to just be all this glitz with the the confetti and the lights. Like we want to actually hear some analysis. Mm -hmm. um, and like you said, all those people were there. Uh, much, big, much bigger names than like a gym manager or something yeah. like that. Um, but, yeah, maybe underutilized. But uh, but it does feel like if you look if you look at the rock stars from year to year, they they do add things and they improve uh -huh. from from year after year and uh and and there are there were a lot of things that they that i'd like to see the ifsc do for example you were talking about the video production and another thing i thought the on-screen graphics were great yes. uh if they if they didn't top it there's this big red x yeah. you know and it's like <laughs> okay if i don't follow comp climbing at least i know what that means and yeah. if they top it they get a i think it was a green check mark or something yeah much easier to read than uh, like the IFSC graphics that are normally like the box that's like half filled in if they got the the zone or what sure. you know it's like you to, sometimes I think uh, about people if they're watching an IFSC comp for the first time and they're not familiar with the scoring they're going to be looking at the on screen graphics like what is you yeah. know I, what is this? I I really like that part where you had the green check for a top a yellow check yeah. for a zone and a black or a red X for I thought that was really cool the yeah. only thing about with bouldering is that that system works great until you have to like break ties, right? Like if the scoring comes down to tops or zones, then, then it's okay. But if it goes down to attempts, then your system still needs numbers. So that's the, that's the one failing of it is that it always gets more complicated somehow. Well, and, and they could still keep track of that stuff. Maybe it's just not stuff that they would necessarily need to present on screen to the viewer sure. unless there was some controversy with a tie or something. That's that's when you bring in Liam Lonsdale and Sasha to explain like, mm -hmm. well, here's what actually – here's how we're going to do this. We actually keep track of attempts and blah, blah, blah. You know, So, yeah, um, yeah I, I, I agree there. There is, there is certainly reason to keep track of all that other stuff. But in terms of having to present it on the screen – for the viewer, I don't, I don't know if it's necessary. I don't know. Yeah, um, my my last big thing that I, I wish was better was the camera work. They seem to have a lot of camera guys, and I felt like I was always just catching the falls. Um, mm -hmm. That was my my big thing. Was I, I feel like we talk about this a lot of just keep the camera in a place where you can understand where the entire climber's body is be able to see where they're going next and where they're coming from. And it's obviously harder when you have two climbers on the wall because there was a man and a woman at the same time, which I'm not personally a fan of. Um, but yeah, that's that was, I feel like there was a lot of artsy camera shots and didn't always tell, uh, tell the story of what was going on. And that on top of not getting to actually watch the previews of the boulders meant that, especially for the first couple climbers of the problem, You'd see a climber on the wall and you don't know where they are, how they got there or what they're holding on to. And suddenly they've fallen and then you're thrown over to the woman and you're trying to do the same thing again. Uh, so that was a little harder than normal. That's that was probably honestly, that was probably my like biggest actual gripe of of stuff that I feel like we should have down by now. Um, yeah, and people were complaining about that on the live stream chat too. Uh, it sounds like there were some gripes from uh, from people about the camera work. Um it's hard. I mean, I just think in general, it's going to be hard anytime you have to cut away from one competitor to go to another competitor. Uh, it, it's it, you're going to miss stuff. And, yeah. and, you know, it's just too bad. I'm not a fan of it. I wish that they just did, you know, all the men and then all the women or something like that. Um, because also just the viewing experience, it's it's hard to keep track. It's like you're watching, like, for instance, like I don't know, Futaba Ito or something. And like they cut away. And so in your mind, rather than watching the man uh, who they've cut away to, you're almost having to like remember where Futaba is. So when sure. they cut back to her, you can, yeah. it's just this weird, it's a lot of, it's a lot of work from the viewer uh, that could be eliminated if they would just separate them. Yeah. I think the, the dual screen, not the dual screen thing, but having two climbers on at a time will only ever be good if the production has a really good replay guy and that means somebody that understands the comp so in depth that he knows which attempts 
are actually the ones that need to be replayed, right? It's not about like the cool move. It's, oh, Futaba topped this. We didn't see it. We need to show people that so they understand where she is in the standings, which if you're just a production person and you don't have a climbing background, you're not going to know when those things matter. So you have to have somebody in the truck that understands that was an important attempt. That's the attempt that because she flailed on it, she can't catch up anymore. We have to show that attempt. This is where it all ended for I, Mori or whatever. Um, and I, I don't know if that exists, if we have those people in those positions for an event like this. Um, but if that was the case, then you can spend, you know, a little longer on this one particular person and then flick over to a very well cut, accurate uh, replay that shows what you're looking for, not just, you know, every cool dino that happens on one climb. Yeah, and, and that's something climbing is going to struggle with as it, as it, as com as the comp scene gets outsourced um, on occasion to these these country these various countries um, TV production. You know, like you, you have an IFSC event in China or something, and it's like it's put on by the Chinese um, TV station TV network. I chances are the people in the in that truck maybe at best they have a sports background. They probably don't have a climbing background, um, so. Uh, yeah, you're just not going to catch that because you know that like the commentators, Sasha and, and Liam and in the case of the IFSC, Charlie and Mike, they certainly know all that nuance. But the people in the truck that are kind of choosing, picking and choosing when to cut and stuff, they don't they probably don't know. So, mm -hmm. yeah, too bad. All right. Last thing, because we basically spend our time just critiquing comps uh, for this particular comp. We were joined by a lot of friends in the chat where everybody was just critiquing this, that or the other thing. Uh, after watching this particular live chat, <laughs> does it make you want to have live <laughs> chat back for the World Cups? Of course it does. That's part of the fun. <laughs> Whenever there's a downtime in the in the event, you can just look over to the chat and see what people are talking about. Um, and in this case, it was uh, a lot of time. It was a random debate about who's the better climber, Yanya or Adam Andra. And, the, uh, the debate I liked was, would Yanya make it in the top 100 male boulders? That right. was at yeah. like premier oh. trolling. Great job to whoever that guy was. You managed to get everybody so mad at you. Uh, yeah, I, I'm still a fan of chat. Because, so first of all, like... The, I think the virtue of live chat with a lot of stuff that I use it for is that there are so many people chatting in it that you like nobody actually gets a chance to see what other people are saying. Like I'm talking about events where you have, you know, maybe 20,000 active users in a chat at once. And so it's just spam. And yeah. the overall effect of it is uh, you only see you only notice things in the chat when it's a uh, like kind of a moment of collective emotion. So you see the chat light up when something awesome happens or when something funny happens or something bad happens. The chat kind of reacts together. But in an event like this where there are maybe like 20 people active in chat instead of 20,000, everybody's message gets attention. And that means all the idiots or all the people that are trying to provoke you get that moment, right? And these people aren't necessarily, they're like, they're not cursing. They're not being racist. They are certainly being stupid and probably being intentionally dumb but it's not something that you can really ban somebody from a chat for so the you know the hard part is even if we had moderators in there which is something i hope the ifse does because having volunteer moderators can really help foster a community of online viewers mm -hmm. uh you still got to tolerate the assholes that either don't know what they're talking about or know exactly what they're talking about and just want to ruin your day um yeah. so well, it didn't change my opinion but it was really it was fun at once because you saw those people asking questions and other people answering those questions really well. And then you saw the hilarious debates about the most trivial shit of, you know, people not knowing what they're talking about. You can always turn the chat off if you're if you don't like it exactly. or hide it or whatever. And you can um, ban individual people yourself so you don't see them. And and I'm trying to think of somebody if they had just now if they're just now getting into the comp scene. Like I think back when um, like when I was just starting to like when the live streams first started whenever like long time ago mm -hmm. years ago um, I guess 2013 I, was the first 2013 year, yeah I like think. I remember um going on I can't remember what websites there were but I would like search around to see if there were any like climbing message boards where you could just like yeah. dialogue with people about that was like the the closest thing there was to really social media at the time or I uh, you know live stream chats like this it's like that's how you would dialogue with people mm -hmm. i think this is a way to do that too for better yeah. or worse i mean like I, I know somebody in the chat said like who's the woman commentator and like somebody actually <laughs> said um but and you know like 
I didn't laugh, see that like, one. Maybe it was somebody that they're just now getting into comp climbing. They don't know, you know? And so somebody said, uh, just answered the question, said it's Sasha DeJulian. And yeah. then maybe that person can then, you know, look up Sasha DeJulian and learn a little about the comp history sure. and stuff. Like, this is just another way, as long as people... Yeah, as long as it doesn't just become a spam fest, um, I think there is some value to this, some educational yeah. value people can learn. Um, so yeah, keep it. Why not? Yeah, you, know? and, and you brought, like talking about the message board thing is if you have a hobby or you have an interest, where can you meet other people with that same interest and hobby, right? Yeah. Um, I Just on the back burner, I've been trying to be active on the comp competitive climbing subreddit because I feel like it might be the closest thing to establishing a group culture around watching comp climbing. I'm starting to think the actual climbing subreddit is the better place to start because there's way more people there. Um, but a lot of them kind of seem resistant to content about, con or maybe they just think I'm shit and the stuff we put out is garbage. Um, but there's nowhere really to go. And what compounds it, as we've talked about in the past, is that the viewership of competitive climbing, there's a lot of people that are not tech savvy. There's a lot of people that don't know what Discord is, or they, you know, aren't used to using Twitter. Like there's nobody active on the IFSE Twitter hashtag. Like that's not actually a yeah. thing. So where do we get that community to build up? Because that's such a strong and valuable thing to have is people feeling like, oh, I love this thing and I can connect with other people that love it. There's nowhere mm -hmm. else to go. But if you can put a chat window right beside the video window, that's your community all of a sudden. And we see the same faces there all the time, right? Like Eddie's always going to be there. And what an amazing person to have available to a live chat community. I'm yep. usually going to be there. And I see a bunch of our commenters and people that watch this show in there. Um, and they're, thank God, the, the ones that aren't just like shit trolling the entire chat. That's such an important thing to foster. I think that's, I think, you know, not having it just because there's the, the inherent difficulty of running an internet chat. I think it's, I think they're making the wrong decision. And mm -hmm. I, I get closer and closer every event to emailing them and just saying, hey, can I please moderate your events? Even though that would mean like ridiculous wake ups for sometimes. Like, yeah. I honestly feel like it would be worth it. Yeah, I think it's, I mean, I think there. it's almost like you can look at the live chats, you can be pessimistic about it, or you can be optimistic. And it, sure, you, you, you have to kind of filter out, there's going to be some spammers in there. But I always try to think like, there's probably some people that are chiming in on this chat that are new to competition climbing. So um, many. And, so Somebody many, asked who Sasha DeJulian was. That yeah. Yeah, there you and go. And I think it was an honest question, right? Mm -hmm. I think like it's totally. just like somebody years ago would have written on the message boards. They would have said like who is I don't know, who is so and so? And like there's so there's a degree of mentorship that can happen there or or, or education certainly. Um and it's just another avenue. I think especially the younger generation now, they're more likely to go on YouTube if, if, when they're curious about something as yeah. opposed to message boards, right? Yeah, so, they like, have never used a message board in their life for sure. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and I, to your point, I don't think that competition is, is a real active topic on like Twitter from no. what I can tell. So like, yeah, if we, if we have people that are expressing a curiosity about this stuff on the live chat, uh, then that's kind of where the, there's this sort of natural environment pop popping up for for comp climbing interest then mm -hmm. then we should foster it the ifsc should help foster it yeah absolutely yeah in the meantime just like and subscribe to plastic weekly and you can hang out in our little community of commenters yes yeah, right. <laughs> I, and i wanted to ask you i wanted to ask well maybe i should save this for the end I guess maybe let's I, call this the end. Cause we're at, okay, we're so, at an hour 13. So let's somebody wrap it up. Did send me a question that they were curious to get our thoughts on. I don't, I don't remember. I didn't write down who it was, okay. but it was an interesting question. And they said that the question was, I don't have it verbatim, but it was something like who is a competitor past or present that you feel like does not get enough recognition. Shit. Yeah, it's a great it's a great question, right? Like this is because we are at a point now where uh, the big name comp climbers like the Yanya and certainly the Olymp all the Olympians, like they're starting to get some legit recognition from mainstream outlets and stuff. So yeah. like, is there somebody who you feel like in history is sort of underappreciated? Um, well, I think that the one thing is that I don't think history is invoked very often, uh, mostly because there isn't a lot of opportunities for analysis and there's not that much content around climbing to talk about 
uh, you know, what has happened in the past and how does it relate to the present? Um, so I think there's, there's a ton of names that matter in the historical sense, but it's not often that you bring up, you know, the duels between, um, like Mina Markovic and Jay and Kim, like that, that's a, a dynasty of, of dueling and lead climbing. That's incredible, but it just doesn't come up very much. You hear the names mentioned, but nobody's created a, a six minute mini documentary on that like epic uh, yeah. set of years or anything. So maybe focusing on something like more recent, I think the one that I would say just because it always stuns me every time I look at it in my, um, in my like set of results is Yulia Kaplina. Um, she is, uh, I don't think she's the most decorated speed climber there is like speed climbing, a lot of randomness because of the bracket. And sometimes mm-hmm. you have a good run and sometimes you don't, but her consistency of almost always being the person to set the fastest time in a speed comp, even if she doesn't win the event is crazy. Um, I think it was like 2015 through 2017. She was at like 60% of speed comps for women. She set the fastest time of the event. Mm. There's no other stage in men's or women's where you had somebody always consistently setting the best time. And the sad part is sometimes those times were set in qualification or quarterfinals where it doesn't really matter because it wasn't in the final round. But her name comes up as the fastest time in speed comps so often in that period. It's I think that's maybe something that should have a little more recognition because she's won a few mm-hmm. speed roll cups and gotten a bunch of medals. But she certainly stands out as somebody that was always the fastest, even if she wasn't the winner. So that yeah. might be my answer. It's a good answer. I um, I kind of had the same reaction to you when when I read the question, which was like, well, there's so many people that are underappreciated because the history of anything pre IFSC is underappreciated or, you know, goes like un unreported a lot of times. And sure. even you could even say like IFSC history pre live stream is really definitely like, from, man. like 2007 yeah. or whenever it started to 2013. It's just like this, it's like this, this void. Um, you have to find the blogs, right? You have to find totally. those old entries from whatever the, you know, if the world cup is in Spain, you got to find the blog post from the Spanish climbing blog to know anything about what happened. Yeah. And, and, um, so I think that, I mean, you could almost just pick any athlete who was winning events back then and make a case for them. Um, in terms of, we'll say like post, like, like after the live stream became a thing, I think there were two, there were two that came to mind. One is just kind of general. I think um, there's some Russians like uh, Dmitry Sherfutinov and um, Rustam Gelmanov. Like if you think several years ago, like I feel like you would always see a Russian in the finals mm-hmm. of like some of these bouldering events. And and it, 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 we we don't see it as much lately these last couple years. Um, but like just a few years ago, Russia was like a, a big kind of powerhouse just like alongside yeah. – you know, Japan and Slovenia, it's like it, Russia was right there. Um, and there's certainly no reason that we couldn't return to that. Rustam Gelmanov was like my favorite climber through oh, yeah. the period when I started climbing because he was known as the guy that would like crimp anything, even if it wasn't a hold. Yeah. Uh, and his hair was like always changing. And then you read his profile in beyond the face where he just basically says like he could never get along with anybody on the Russian team. And he always felt like an outsider. Like he would, I really love that guy. That was uh Yeah. He, yeah, uh, he's so I guess he has a family now and stuff and he's a root setter, but, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah he was a favorite. he's great. He, I, you were all, he, like whenever he was in a finals, you would always, you were just like, I'm going to watch because he was so exciting. Sure. Um, I also think just it, this question was posed to me before this, this Adidas rock stars happened, but I was mm-hmm. thinking, uh, probably Sasha DeJulian as well. You know, she, she doesn't really compete anymore, but there was a time right around like 2011 ish, um, where she was kind of the the big name in the American comp scene. And she, you know, she, she, uh, she has since just become like the, you know, outdoor, that's kind of her thing, outdoor focus. Um, but, uh, I, I don't know how many world cups off the top of my head she did, but I know she was active in the world championships at, Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, around then and uh, did quite well, if I remember correctly. Yeah, so. my, my computer with all that stuff is like too far away for me to get it without my headphones yeah. ripping off. But I think she is like most Americans where her celebrity came from kind of the combination of American media and the legacy of American outdoor climbing. Because in comps, she wasn't, or in World Cups, 
Uh, she wasn't that decorated, um, mm. which I think is a pattern for a lot of famous American climbers. You can kind of see it in Ashima. Um, Alex Puccio is definitely the most successful American comp climber. Um, you know, she's had consistent results. She was part of that pack of incredible U.S. female boulders or, or of, of female boulders, sorry, uh, yeah. through a lot of World Cups. But uh, yeah, those are well, those post, are both good answers. Post um, Puccio would be post uh, IFS like IFSC era. Obviously, Herb, Robin Herbisfield would probably be um, international. Yeah, if somebody can post the fucking results. Yeah, totally. She yeah. probably <laughs> would be. But yeah. yeah, I haven't seen most of those. Um, but it's an interesting question. I'd be curious to hear if there are any people that are watching this that are kind of like longtime viewers of the circuit. I'd be curious, just some other names. Like this is the type of thing where like somebody throws a name at you and you're like, Oh yeah. Like that person is, you sure. know, it's like kind of fun to hear just like these, these names tossed around as, as uh, like underappreciated or, or, you know, un- doesn't get the recognition. It's a cool little question. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, totally. Um, yeah. Let's end it there. That was a fun question just to take our, take our minds off of uh, camera angles and, uh, and the live chat. Yeah. Um, yeah. This has been the debrief. When is our next? Uh, when's the next one? We got to come back for next, crunch, next don't week, we? Isn't it for the? Isn't it next week? Or we got is two, it weeks. two weeks. So okay, two. Monday the thirtieth is going to be a debrief of. Man, the season isn't even over yet. Holy shit. Uh, yeah, we still have three lead comps to go on the World Cup circuit. The next one's in Kranj in two weeks in Slovenia. So hopefully a uh, strong showing from Janja. This could be the return of Janja after uh, after getting domed a little bit in the first half of the lead season, but making a comeback at the World Championships. Maybe she takes the rest of the season and proves that Chai and Seo was a fluke the entire time. Who knows? She can do it in her hometown. Yeah, it's strange to go back to uh, the World Cup after the the World Championships and all the Olympic hype and then the mm-hmm. Adidas rock stars. It's kind of like we're getting back to our roots here. Yeah, exactly. Um, now, traditionally, I think like competitors don't always do uh, that well when comps are in their home country. Obviously, there are cases when they do. Like I'm thinking of like didn't uh, Julie Verm and Jan Hoyer win in Munich or something like that, or they did well in Munich one year, but. Um, but I know, like, we've had instances where, like, events are in Japan and stuff, and there's just, like, it's, it's, my point is, it's not a given that just because it's in Slovenia that, like, all the Slovenians will do great, although sure. they might, you know, who yeah. knows. I'm uh, trying to think, the last, last time a Boulder won in their home country was Alex Puccio at the end of last season, she won Vail. Yeah. The last time a speed climber won in their home country, I'm pretty sure was Yiling Song mm-hmm. in Wujang or Chongqing, I can't remember which one. When was the last time a lead climber won in their home country? Ooh, there's some trivia. See, that's the Thursday um, thinker right there. I got to pull that one out. Oh, I think it was Doman Skofich two years ago, 2017 in Crunch. Wow, I'm kind of surprised it was two years ago. I thought it would have been maybe more recent. Um, if you count world championships, though, it would have been... Uh, um, Schubert won the world championship last year in lead at Innsbruck, right? Because it's so... Yeah. (laughs) Okay, see, we got into... We're in the weeds of stuff we don't know. So we're going to end it right here. Thanks very much for watching this episode of The Debrief. We'll be back in two weeks talking about the Cronj Lead World Cup. Until then, make sure you leave a like and subscribe and tell your friends about it. And uh, of course, stay tuned to the channel for other content coming up. I'll be at Block Shop Open in Montreal uh, this coming weekend. So hopefully there'll be some content coming out of that. Hopefully I'll get a chance to talk to Sean McCall, Yoshiki Ogata, Miho Nanaka. All of them are there. So I might have a few minutes with them. Otherwise, we'll see you in two weeks. Thanks for watching. Catch you in the next one.